Hello and welcome to Chapter 16 Respiratory Emergencies Lecture. After you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you will understand the significance and characteristics of respiratory emergencies in infant, child, and adult populations. You will be able to demonstrate a fundamental comprehension of the following topics, respiratory anatomy and physiology, pathophysiology, signs and symptoms of various respiratory etiologies, including asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and pneumonia, and the assessment and management necessary to provide basic and advanced care in the pre-hospital setting. Okay, so let's get started. Respiratory disease is one of the most common emergency medical services dispatches. Let's talk about the epidemiology. So asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are among the top 10 chronic conditions causing restricted activity. Approximately 15 million Americans have COPD, and that's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and approximately 25 million Americans have asthma. Pneumonia is one of the most common fatal illnesses in developing countries. Some respiratory diseases are genetic or intrinsic, while others are caused by external or extrinsic factors. Researchers have yet to fully decipher the multifactorial mechanism by which many respiratory diseases develop. So let's talk about the anatomy and physiology next, do a little review. The primary structures are an inverted tree. So the trachea represents the trunk and the alveoli represents the leaves. The tracheobronchial tree. Now the trachea is the windpipe, the trunk of the tracheobronchial tree. It carries air to the lungs and it extends about four to five inches from the larynx to the right and left mainstem bronchi. The bronchi, you have the right and left mainstem bronchi, they continue to branch into lobes of lungs. The secondary or lober bronchi then divide into tertiary or segmental bronchi and then into subsegmental bronchi before ultimately becoming bronchioles. Bronchioles, the terminal bronchioles are thin and have little cellular structure. This is helpful for gas exchange. Now bronchioles lack cilla. They have uh, protective mucus and are not shielded by smooth muscle or more rigid structures. So once a foreign matter reaches the terminal bronchioles and alveoli, it does not come back out. Smooth muscle surrounds conducting airways down to the subsegmental level. Bronchial constriction occurs when the smooth muscle narrows these larger airways. Bronchiodilator medications have little effect below the segmental level. Now let's talk about alveoli. The terminal airways and alveoli include branches 16 to 24 of the uh, tracheobronchial tree. The entire surface of the alveoli and terminal bronchioles is covered in capillaries and participates in gas exchange. So the mediastinum, that's a space in the middle of the chest that consists of the heart, large blood vessels, the conducting airways, and the conducting airways are the trachea and the main stem bronchii, and other organs. It might widen if the patient is bleeding from a ruptured aorta and might trap air from a traumatic injury. Pulmonary blood flow is what we're gonna talk about next. And the blood flows from the heart to the lungs via the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery branches into smaller and smaller vessels until the pulmonary capillary bed surrounds the alveoli and terminal bronchioles. More gas exchange takes place between the lung bases and the circulatory system than between the apexes or the tops of the lungs and the circulatory system. Pulmonary capillaries are narrow and red blood cells normally pass through in a single file. 
but patients with chronic lung disease and chronic hypoxia often generate more red blood cells, making their blood thick. The effort to push blood through the pulmonary capillaries can strain the right side of the heart. Right-sided heart failure because of COPD is known as core pulmonale. So perfusion is a circulatory component of the respiratory system. Blood must consistently flow through the pulmonary vessels so adequate oxygen can come into contact with the blood. A large pulmonary emboli can block blood flow to the entire lung. So let's talk about mechanisms of respiratory control. You have cardiovascular regulation and the lungs are closely linked to cardiac function. Changes in the right or left side of the heart can have pulmonary consequences. Left-sided heart failure typically progresses much faster than right-sided heart failure. Right-sided heart failure can worsen over days while left-sided heart failure can kill in minutes. The right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs and the left side of the heart receives blood from the lungs and it pumps to and around the body to perfuse organs and tissues. Mild hypoxia causes an increase in heart rate. Severe hypoxia often causes bradycardia and uncorrected hypoxic insults may trigger a fatal cardiac dysrhythmia. So various forms of heart failure can cause changes in fluid balance, right-sided heart pumping pressure, or left-sided heart pumping pressure. Then there's muscle control. The body takes in air by negative pressure. It's like a vacuum cleaner, basically. And air is pulled in through the mouth, nose, or other turbinates, and around the epiglottis and glottis. The thorax is an airtight box with the flexible diaphragm at the bottom and an open tube or the trachea at the top. The diaphragm flattens during quiet breathing. The overall size of the container increases and air is sucked in to fill the increasing space inside the thorax. The amount of air moved each minute is the minute ventilation and it can be increased by deep breathing or more rapid breathing. Traumatic openings in the thorax provide a route for air to be sucked in. Air ends up in the pleural space causing a sucking chest wound. In the cause of a flail chest, multiple ribs are broken in more than one place, that's a flail chest. Free floating thorax sections are pulled in when the patient breathes. This limits the amount of air sucked through the trachea. Now, the next mechanism of respiratory control we're gonna talk about is renal status. The kidneys play a part in controlling fluid balance, acid-base balance, and blood pressure. These factors affect the pulmonary mechanisms that deliver um, and the delivery of oxygen to body tissues. Patients with severe kidney disease often present with respiratory signs and symptoms. Patients with CHF, because of renal disease, can be difficult to manage because diureses may be difficult. Acid-based disturbances may cause hyperventilation that may be mistaken for respiratory disorders. And then you have hypoventilation. Carbon dioxide accumulates in the blood when the lungs fail to work properly. It combines with water to form bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions, so it forms carbonic acid, and it results in acidosis. Impaired ventilation is caused by a variety of factors. Carbon dioxide level is directly related to the pH, so hypoventilation patients usually have respiratory acidosis. As carbon dioxide levels rise, pH levels drop. Problems that can cause patients to hypoventilate include conditions that impair lung function. So you could have carbon dioxide levels rise when the patient is breathing, but gas levels are impaired or gas exchange is impaired. This situation may occur in cases of um, pneumonia or pulmonary edema, 
um, uh, asthma or COPD. Okay, so hypoventilation can also be caused by conditions that impair the mechanics of breathing. So gas flow can be suppressed by a flailed chest, a diaphragmic rupture, severe retractions, air or blood filled in the abdomen, abdominal or chest binding, or anything else that restricts pressure changes that facilitates respiration. Um, obesity, hypoventilation syndrome, is a respiratory compromise related to morbid obesity. So conditions that impair the neuromuscular apparatus, patients with head trauma or intracranial infections or brain tumors may have damaged respiratory centers in the brain. Serious spinal cord injury above C5 may block nerve impulses that stimulate breathing or Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a progressive muscle weakness and paralysis disorder, may cause ineffective breathing if paralysis reaches the diaphragm. Conditions that reduce respiratory drive include intoxication with alcohol, narcotics and other drugs, head injuries, hypoxic drive, and asphyxia. The ultimate manifestation of hypoventilation is respiratory arrest, then followed by cardiac arrest. Initiate aggressive treatment to assist the patient's respiratory efforts. Okay, so we just talked about hypoventilation. Now we're going to talk about hyperventilation. This occurs when people breathe in excess of metabolic need by increasing the rate and depth of the respiration. They expel more carbon dioxide than normal, and it results in alkalosis. When triggered by emotional distress or panic attack, it may be called hysterical ventilation or hyperventilation syndrome. In, an, in acute hyperventilation syndrome, patients feel they cannot breathe at all. Respiratory alkalosis causes numbness and tingling in the hands and the feet and around the mouth. Patients complain of chest pain, and respiratory alkalosis will ultimately lead to carpal pedal spasm, during which the hands and feet are clenched in a claw-like position. The traditional therapy of having the patient breathe his or her own carbon dioxide from a paper bag or from a partial rebreathing mask can be dangerous. Patients quickly exhaust the oxygen and the gas they are breathing and hyperventilation in patients with acidosis may be the body's attempt to raise the pH level to normal. Some examples are Cushmal respirations or sepsis or shock. It should not be treated by rebreathing their own carbon dioxide. And important to rule out all possible causes. So treatment may include sedation if the patient is truly hysterical and hyperventilating, you want to help the patient understand that hyperventilation may occur if the behavior precipitating the episode is repeated. Psychological support techniques include breathing with the patient or having the patient count to two between breaths, gradually increasing to higher numbers, or distraction techniques. Having the patient sing a song, perhaps? Okay. So let's talk about the patient assessment. Thorough respiratory assessment is needed. This includes much more than just listening to the lung sounds. Many respiratory ailments are life-threatening and respiratory assessments should be done early in the patient assessment. So of course, we talk about the scene size up. We take standard precautions and use proper personal protective equipment. And remember, uh, minimal protection when treating a person in respiratory distress is exam gloves, exam or eye protection, and a face shield and gown if patient is suspected of having a respiratory infection. A range of dangerous situations and toxins are associated with pulmonary complaints. These include diminished oxygen concentrations, such as enclosed or improperly ventilated spaces, or carbon monoxide or irritant gases, or highly contagious respiratory illnesses. Respiratory disease can impair ventilation, diffusion, perfusion, or a combination of all three. 
the most common complaint of patients with a respiratory disease is dyspnea. The most common cause of dyspnea is hypercarbia, and that's too much carbon dioxide in the blood. Rapid onset dyspnea may be caused by an acute bronchospasm, anaphylaxis, pulmonary emboli, or a pneumothorax. So, proximal nocturnal dyspnea presents suddenly in the middle of the night and may signal left-sided heart failure. Patients' ability to move air may be hindered by the factors that limit diaphragm movement, restrict chest wall movement, and disrupt the integrity of the thoracic cage. So let's talk about the primary survey next. You want to establish and maintain an open airway, form a general impression. Now, the body type may be associated with the particular pathologic condition. So emphysema, they're going to have that barrel chest, muscle wasting. They'll be pursed lip breathing, often uh, tachypnea, and usually without profound hypoxia and cyanosis. So severely ill patients with immune system disorders and those with cancer or other end-stage diseases are easy to identify due to their sickly appearance. Patients with chronic bronchitis tend to be more sedimentary, sedentary and may be obese. They often sleep in a chair or recliner, have a waste basket overflowing with tissues and a cup of spit up secretions, may have a urinal near their chair to avoid frequent bathroom trips, and have medications, inhalers, or other aerosolized nebulizer nearby. Assess oxygen demand and work of breathing. So if patient is stable to rest, observe the condition during typical exertion. So note oxygen saturation while at rest and during simple exertion. Increased work of breathing, anxiety, hypoxia, or fever can trigger tachycardia, diaphoresis, and pallor. Note the patient's position and determine the degree of distress. So patients in respiratory distress prefer sitting positions. The tripod position that's leaning forward and rotating the scapula outward. If a patient is willing to lay flat, it might be a sign of deterioration in condition. A patient who holds his head in the head tilt chin lift or sniffing position to maximize airflow through the upper airway. A fatigued patient with respiratory, severe respiratory disease may present with head bobbing. That's an ominous sign of immediate decomposition and often um, a pre-terminal behavior. Assess breathing alterations. Can involve the conducting airways, the alveoli, muscle and nerves involved in breathing, or the rigid structures of the thorax. Increased work of breathing, so patients using accessory muscles to breathe are a danger of tiring out. Using the abdominal muscles to push and pull air out, and using the chest and neck muscles to pull air in. That's the um, using accessory muscles. When infants and small children use accessory muscles to breathe, the flexible sternum cartilage often collapses, leaving bony retractions. A patient of any age may pull the soft tissues in between the ribs above or below the sternum and clavicles causing soft tissue retractions, and profound inner thoracic pressure changes can cause peripheral pulses to weaken or disappear during inspiration. Altered rate and depth of respiration. So count the respirations while you appear to be doing something else. A patient with adequate rate but low volume will have an inadequate minute volume. Remember the minute volume is the respiratory rate times the tidal volume that equals the minute volume. Monitor trends in respiratory rates and note the pattern and the inspiratory to expiratory ratio. So that's the I to E ratio. Now, abnormal breath sounds. You want to auscultate the sounds 
systematically whenever possible because the left and right lungs are not symmetric. Remember, the right lung has three lobes and the left lung has two lobes. And some conditions are gravity dependent and others diffuse throughout lung fields. The upper lobes are heard by listening to the anterior part of the chest. The middle right lobe is best heard just beneath or lateral to the right breast. And the mid axillary line is the best place to listen for confirmation of the ET2 placement. Breast sounds are created by airflow in the large airways. Tracheal breast sounds are often harsh and tubular. Bronchial breast sounds are loud. Bronchiovascular breast sounds are softer and sound the same during inspiration and expiration. Soft, breezy vascular sounds are the most commonly heard breast sounds. This image shows normal breast sounds heard over different parts of the chest. Some pathologic conditions cause normal breast sounds to be heard in abnormal places. The sounds move better through fluid than through air. The quality of breast sounds is dependent on the amount of tissue between the stethoscope and the respiratory structures. Breast sounds and vocalizations travel poorly through a hyperinflated lung. Abnormal or adventitious breast sounds are extra sounds that can be heard on top of the other breast sounds. Wheezes are high-pitched whistling sounds from air being forced through narrowed or um, airways. Now, wheezes may be diffuse, such as asthma, or localized, such as a foreign body obstruction. Crackles are discontinuous noises heard during lung auscultation. They're caused by air spaces popping open, such as fine crackles or fluid or secretion movement in larger airways. And now that's coarse crackles. They're usually associated with increased lung fluid. You have rails and that's high pitched crackles in the lung bases heard at the end of inspiration and con consistent with pulmonary edema. And then you have ronchii, which are low pitched crackles caused by secretion in larger airways. So rails are high pitched crackles in lung bases and ronchii is low pitched crackles caused by secretion in larger airways. Audible sounds include strider, and that's from the upper airway, a grunting from the lower airway obstruction, or a death rattle. Now that's a low pitch gurgling sound heard when patients can no longer clear their own secretions. As patients become more ill, the audible sounds will become lower. As respiratory distress worsens, the sounds may become, begin to diminish. The most ominous breath sounds are no sounds at all, which indicates the patient is no longer moving enough air to ventilate the lungs. Noisy breathing is obstructive breathing. So snoring, gurgling, and strider, those are obstructive breathing. Snoring is a partial obstructing of the upper airway by the tongue. Gurgling is fluid in the upper airway. Strider is a harsh, high-pitched sound during inhalation. It indicates narrowing from swelling or laryngeal edema. Quiet breathing may suggest hyperventilation or shock. Now sputum. Note if the patient is coughing up discolored sputum. Fever and chills with increased sputum production is a sign of infection. Blood Blood-tinged sputum is a warning sign of tuberculosis or that the airway blood vessels have broken from forceful coughing. Pink foam or froth is a sign that the air is forced through pulmonary edema fluid, as in cases of congestive heart failure. Note pus-like mucus color and change of any other characteristics. Now abnormal breathing patterns. So 
altered respiratory patterns may indicate a neurologic insult. Brain trauma, any disturbances in brain function or overdose with a central nervous system depressant may depress respiratory control centers in the medulla. Severe traumatic brain injuries may damage or deprive blood flow in various parts of the brain, changing breathing patterns. Most of the brain's respiratory centers are in and around the brainstem. So you could have um, apneusnic breathing, and that's caused by damage to the center of the brain that regulates respiratory pause. You could have biot rep respirations, and that's grossly irregular patterns breathing with lengthy apneic periods or Cheyenne Stokes respiratory pattern, and that's breathing deep gradually increases then decreases followed by a period of apnea. Injury to the spinal cord and certain illnesses may disable the respiratory muscles from functioning normally. Tidal volume is going to be shallow, minute volume correspondingly decreases, and patients often need assisted ventilation. You want to assess circulation in the context of respiratory emergencies. Assessing skin color is the fastest way to begin determining the adequacy of patient circulation. Note generalized cyanosis from oxygen desaturation or profound paler of shock. For uh, more subtle information, assess the mucous membranes. So variations include cyanosis, and that's healthy hemoglobin levels in an adult are 12 to 14. At about 5 desaturation, the person will begin to show cyanotic blue discoloration. Some patients in cardiac arrest have deep blue skin, although some are pale. Cyanosis may develop earlier in patients with high hemoglobin levels. Patients with chronic respiratory conditions may have low levels of chronic cyanosis. And patients with chronic bronchitis may have chronic peripheral cyanosis. When you get a chocolate brown skin, that mucous membranes may turn brown from high levels of methylhemoglobin from nitrates and some toxic exposures. It's more evident in venous blood than skin and mucous membranes. When you get pale skin, it's caused by blood flow reduction to small vessels near the skin surface. It could be possible surface, uh, sources can be shock, hypoxia, some type of cold environment, or a catecholamine release. You also want to check for dehydration when you're um, looking for, at the circulation. You want to look for dry crack lips or a dry furrowed tongue or maybe dry sunken eyes. That can indicate dehydration. Patients with respiratory problems are usually transported to the closest hospital. If respiratory distress is related to renal failure, a facility that can provide emergency dialysis would be a better option. If multiple emergency departments are available, weigh the benefits of taking the person to his or her preferred facility versus the closest facility. Then, when it comes to the history taking, we're going to find the chief complaint and have patients ex explain what they are feeling in their own words or what change that made you call 911 today. So common complaints include increased cough or fever, wheezing or dyspnea. Patients may not be able to talk because they are in so having so bad a breath, um, difficulty breathing. So patients may be able to manage with one or word senses or uh, nodding yes or shaking no. Medical history may have to be taken from the family members or clues. And basic therapy, oxygen, or an air slice therapy may have to be given before you could get a complete history from a patient. If intubation is necessary, the patient will not be able to give you their history, of course. If the patient can give you the chief complaint, he or she may be able to tell you the exact problem, such as maybe an ac acute flare-up or <clears throat> exacerbation of an illness, asthma with a fever, 
The typical asthma attack that responds to treatment but occurs again shortly after may be uh, caused by an underlying infection. The underlying trigger must be treated before the symptoms will end. So that's asthma with a fever. Non-delivery of medication. So medications may be exhausted. Medications may be outdated or they may have improperly stored the medications. Travel-related conditions. So patients may present with significant pulmonary edema after a lengthy journey because they did not want to take their diuretic medications. Um, so ask the patient, what medications do you use? Followed by, do you take them during your travels? Uh, dyspnea triggers. So even if the patient knows what triggers his or her reactive airway, it cannot always be avoided. And seasonal conditions. So bacteria, mold, or fungi, or excessive heat, humidity, or cold, pollen, dust, and smog can cause respiratory disease flare-ups. Also, non-compliance therapy, so some patients with chronic respiratory disease, um, they rebel against therapy. Uh, the long-term nature of the therapy may be misunderstood, or patients may only sporadically use their treatment. And then with the history taking, you're going to get that sample history. You want to use the mnemonic sample to obtain the history of the present illness and medical history. S is signs and symptoms, A is allergy, M is medications, and you want to um, review the patient's prescribed and over-the-counter medicines. P is pat pertinent past medical history. And respiratory illness are often repeating pathologic conditions, and a patient's experience can serve as the baseline to assess the current condition. So ask, do you feel better or worse than last time, or how often does this happen? L is the last oral intake, and uh, events, E is events preceding the onset of the complaint, and what has the patient already tried, and did it have any effect on them? Then when you get into the secondary assessment, that's that focused exam, and you want to um, do a neuro assessment or neurological assessment. You could note the level of consciousness, if the lungs are not functioning correctly, oxygen may not be delivered to the bloodstream and carbon dioxide may not be removed from the body. You could do a neck exam. Note any jugular vein distension, a condition when the jugular veins are engorged with blood in patients in a semi-sitting position. It's common in patients with asthma and COPD, often seen in healthy young adults with spine um, when supine, and in people who are laughing or singing. It could be caused by cardiac tamponade, pneumothorax, heart failure, or COPD, and it may indicate cardiac failure as the source of the dyspnea. Note the trachea for deviations when you're looking at the neck. It's a sign of attention pneumo. This is difficult to see except in extreme cases because it occurs behind the sternum. Consider palpating the trachea at the substernal notch. Okay, and then you're going to do a chest and abdomen exam. The combination of jugular venous distension and heptomegaly may present in right-sided heart failure. So feel for vibrations in the chest as the patient breathes chest or abdominal trauma can cause respiratory distress. You want to exam, uh, do an examination of the extremities. So note edema of the ankles or lower back. Check for peripheral cyanosis and check the pulse. So signs, uh, check for signs of profound tachycardia. Note any pulseless paradoxus. Check the skin temp and note any distal clubbing from chronic hypoxia. Vital signs and monitoring devices, so you want patients under stress, can be expected to have tachycardia and hypertension. And an omnia sign of impending arrest includes hyper or, or bradycardia, hypotension, and failing respiratory rates. Repeated vital signs, an ECG, and pulse ox reading are the data most commonly collected. Also, uh, use a stethoscope. 
buy the best possible one and take care of it. Um, make sure that the earpieces are clean and wipe the main tubing with an all-purpose cleaner. The diaphragm is for high pitch sounds and the bell is for low pitch sounds. Some newer ones allow a single head to transmit both high and low sounds depending on pressure exerted. The earpieces can be tilted further forward for a better fit and the longer tubing, the more um, noise that can be heard. When it comes to pulse ox, this is a non-invasive way to measure the percentage of hemoglobin with oxygen attached. Oxygen saturation over 94 is normal, since a pulse ox must be able to read pulsatile capillary bed correctly, nail polish may need to be removed, in cold extremities, inadequate peripheral perfusion, or patient movement can make reading inaccurate. A variety of pulse ox probes may, be, may allow readings to be taken from the earlobe, forehead, or other areas of the body, and those are available. If a pulse rate is displayed, the oxygen saturation reading should match the patient's palpated heart rate. If a patient's hemoglobin level is low, the pulse ox reading will be correspondingly high. A pulse ox does not differentiate between oxygen and carbon monoxide molecules attached to the hemoglobin, so remember that. The oxyhemoglobin Disassociation curve shows the relationship between oxygen saturation and the amount of oxygen dissolved in the plasma. So that's PaO2. N-tidal carbon dioxide monitor, that's N-tidal detection or waveform capnography, and it's discussed in detail in chapter 15, the oxygen management chapter. Peak expiratory flow meter, and that's the peak flow it's a maximum flow rate at which the patient can expel air from the lungs. The lower value indicates the larger airways have bronchial constriction or bronchial edema. Normal peak flow values are between 350 and 700 liters a minute and are var variable by age, sex, and height. A peak flow less than 150 liters a minute is an inadequate level and signs of uh, signals significant distress. And then you want to do your reassessment. You need to contact medical control to report any change in the patient's level of consciousness. Contact medical control before assisting with administration of any prescribed medicines and document any changes and any orders given by medical control. All right, so let's talk about emergency medical care. That's what we're here for. To treat respiratory compromise, your goal is to provide supportive care, administer oxygen, and provide monitoring and transport. The exception is bronchial constriction with a host of bronchial dilators available. In respiratory failure, we need to intubate and manually ventilate. Also, CPAP and BiPAP are also provided to be uh, are proved to be effective strategies and may help avoid intubation in some patients. All right, so perform standard interventions. Oxygen administration to keep the saturation greater or equal to 94%. We're gonna establish an IV line if necessary and provide psychological support. Also allow the patient to assume the position of greatest comfort. With decrease, um, the work of breathing. So muscles must work much harder during respiratory distress. Patients can compensate for respiratory distress by using um, energy for breathing to maintain oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. But this requires even more oxygen and ventilation. It will become progressively dehydrated, malnourished and fatigued, and may eventually experience decompensa decompensation and that's respiratory failure. Some patients with asthma may compensate for days. The Trendelenburg and supine positions cause the diaphragm compression from abdominal organs, especially in overweight patients. So shortness of breath from laying flat is known 
as orthopedia. To decrease the work of breathing, help the patient sit up if the position is more comfortable. Remove restricted clothing and do not make the patient walk. Relieve gastric distension and do not bind the chest or have the patient lay on the unaffected lung. Let's talk about providing supplemental oxygen next. You want to administer oxygen in effective concentrations. Bag valve mass ventilation and supplemental oxygen or more advanced airway management techniques should be used on patients who are not breathing adequately. Reassess breathing status, then adjust treatment as needed. If it is accurate and if the patient's hemoglobin is normal, pulse ox is a good guide to oxygenation. Oxygen concentrations higher than 50% should be used only in patients with hypoxia who do not respond to lower concentrations. The use of 100% oxygen should be for the shortest periods possible. Most patients with good oxygen saturation, and that's of course at, at least 94%, do not benefit from supplemental oxygen. However, it remains common practice to administer low flow oxygen to patients with trauma stroke, and acute coronary syndrome, but don't over-oxygenate them. Follow local protocol and consult medical control in the event of carbon monoxide intoxication or with a pregnant patient. Administer a bronchodilator, and they have various um, varying benefits. Those with bronchospasms will benefit only slightly an oxygen concentration may need to be reduced while treating with aerosolized sprays. Use of non-rebreathing masks might be better than aerosolized spray in these cases. Bronchodilators are ineffective in cases with pneumonia, pulmonary edema, and heart disease. Fast-acting bronchodilators, they're the most common types used by stimulating the beta-2 receptors in the lung. Past strategy was to give aerosolized atropine, and ibotropium is now available as an aerosolized or inhaler. These two medications are sometimes prescribed in a premixed cocktail. And then there's aerosolized therapy. So aerosolized nebulizers deliver a fine mist of liquid medication and particles of five micrometers or smaller enter the lower respiratory tract. To generate the optimal particle size, the nebulizer needs a gas flow of at least six liters. At home, most aerosolized treatments are run with a small air compressor. The patients may only receive 30 to 40% oxygen via treatment. Aerosolized our aerosol may be contraindicated if removing a patient's non-rebreathing mass causes further hypoxia. A nebulizer can be held in front of the patient's face set for a blow-by technique and, or attached to a mouthpiece or face mask or a tracheostomy collar. Aerosolized therapy can disperse other drugs through aerosolized treatment including corticosteroids or um, antiesthetic drugs or antitussives. Newer bronchodilators cause less tachycardia than older ones, and they can be repeated treatments for bronchospasms. Then you have meter dose inhalers. These inhalers deliver or should deliver the same amount of medication as aerosolized treatments, aerosol treatments. Document how often the patient is taking those puffs at home. Contact medical control before administering additional doses if required in your protocols. Ambulance meter dose inhalers should have spacers in them. And so tips for your patients to avoid common errors include patients should inhale deeply as the inhaler is discharged. Patients should not blow into the spacer. They should suck the medication out of the bottom. The best particle disposition comes from a laminar flow that is smooth and low pressure. And patients should inhale the medication deeply and hold their breath for a few seconds. Make sure the inhaler contains the medication. Keep the spacer and um, 
canister holder clean to avoid inhaling dust and particles. And after using a corticor steroid inhaler, rinse the mouth and water or mouthwash. Failure of meter dose inhalers is often due to user error. A patient must be willing and able to use the meter dose inhaler properly so the medication can reach the lungs. Use of an inhaler is contraindicated if the patient cannot move enough air to draw in the medication into the lungs. The patient may not realize the inhaler is empty and the patient may inhale at the wrong time. Next, we're gonna talk about dry powder inhalers. So some respiratory medications are dispensed by means of a plastic disc, and the inhaler holds about a one month's worth of medication. Other devices require the patient to insert a capsule of powdered medication, and the capsule is pierced when the patient compresses the button. These are rarely used during emergency care. So electrolytes such as magnesium may have a role in bronchodilation as well in severe asthma attacks. And some physicians use this as a last ditch effort before intubation. Corticosteroids reduce bronchial swelling, so they reduce edema. They have a variety of adverse effects though. So Cushing syndrome, and that's a classic moon face and generalized edema rapidly change in blood glucose levels and a blunt uh, to the immune system. They, uh, sl they need slow discontinuation and one to two weeks therapy to avoid long-term use. Inhaled corticosteroids, so do not seem to have the same adverse effects as the oral ones though, and it's becoming standard in asthma and COPD patients. IV corticosteroids, these are common in the medical field. A single bolus of IV corticosteroids does not seem to cause negative long-term effects. Methyl, ethylprednisone, and hydrocortisone IV boluses are used for acute asthma attacks or acute COPD ex exacerbations. Onset of the drug takes hours though, so consult medical local protocols and medical control before use. Okay, so administer a vasodilator. Treatments for pulmonary edema cause vasodilation, sequestering more fluid in venous circulation and decreasing preload. Nitrates can be used if the patient has adequate blood pressure and does not take um, an inhibitor. So morphine sulfate is not likely to increase venous capacity, but it does decrease anxiety. Restore fluid balance. So it is common to give fluids to dehydrated younger patients, but too much fluid in an elderly patient or a patient with cardiac dysfunction could result in pulmonary edema. Assess breath sounds before and after giving fluids to make sure the patient is not overhydrated. Hydrating patients with pneumonia can cause the pneumonia to blossom or expand. And then there's giving a diuretic. So giving diuretics to patients with pneumonia or asthma may dehydrate them and cause secretions to plug smaller airways. Diuretics are used to help reduce blood pressure and maintain fluid balance in patients with heart failure. Diuretics remove excess fluid from circulation, keeping it out of the lungs of patients with pulmonary edema. And loop diuretics are commonly used in emergency situations. Many diuretics cause potassium loss though, and this can lead to cardiac dysrhythmias and chronic muscle cramping. Do not give diuretics to patients with pneumonia or dehydration and patients with renal failure may require large diuretic doses or they may have no response at all. So when you talk about support or assisting ventilations, aggressive breathing support if the patient becomes fatigued. So CPAP and BiPAP are preclude, they may preclude intubation in some patients. Patients may simply require BVM for short periods of time. Continuous positive airway pressure, we just talked about that, so CPAP. It's used to an obstructive sleep apnea and respiratory failure 
Many people with obstructive sleep apnea wear a CPAP at night to maintain airway while they sleep. So CPAP therapy for respiratory failure is delivered through a mask secured to the face by a strapping system and positive pressure is created in the chest when a bag mask device is used. So pressure that is too high causes problems too. A simple pneumo can evolve. Um, air leaks can produce large amounts of subcutaneous air. And intrathoracic pressure can retard or completely block venous returns. So recent understanding of ramifications have led to CPR guidelines that emphasize lower ventilation rates, smaller volumes, and lower pressures. If the patient already has low blood pressure, too much CPAP can stop venous return and cause sudden additional drop in blood pressure. So you have to monitor those closely. Make sure there's a good seal with minimal leaking and some patients may fight or cannot tolerate a CPAP mask while others can be talked into the process. Bi-level positive airway pressure. So with BiPAP, one level of pressure is delivered on inspiration and a different level of pressure is delivered during exhalation. So for example, BiPAP that is set to 20 slash 8 gives 20 um, centimeters of O2 pressure during inhalation and 8 centimeters of HO2 pressure during exhalation. So it's more like normal breathing, often more comfortable for patients. This is more complex and expensive, so it's not commonly found in the field. Then you have automated transport ventilators. So it's a flow-restricted oxygen-powered ventilation with built-in timers and some permanently set to deliver 40 liters a minute of oxygen flow. And then intubating the patient. And this can be life-saving and many can be exubated in the hospital setting and have a good outcome, but issues to consider. So intubation should, intubation should be the last option for patients with asthma. So ventilate the patients before cardiac arrest occurs. Patients who are severely intoxicated or who have had a stroke may have little or no gag reflex. In patients with diabetes or in cases of an overdose, an ampule of 50% dextrose or naloxone may change the need for intubation. So just use a bag valve mask for a few minutes and then ventilate slowly over one second and only enough to produce visible chest rise. Okay, when you talk about giving medications directly through the endotracheal tube, the American Heart Association guidelines discourage this practice. IV or IO medication administered administration is preferred. All right, so let's talk about the pathophysiology, assessment and management of obstructive upper airway diseases. Now, when you talk about the pathophysiology, the tongue is the most common cause of the airway obstruction if the patient is unresponsive. Anyone with a decreased level of consciousness, especially in the supine position, is at a risk for upper airway obstruction. Audible sounds during breathing include snoring, gurgling, squeaking, or bob bubbling. Strider may be associated with accessory mu muscle use or retractions. So a pillow under the head of an unresponsive patient may make the problem worse. Obstructive sleep apnea may be caused by excessive soft tissue in the airway, and it can be manually displaced with different maneuvers such as the recovery position. If spinal motion restriction is not needed, the safest position for patients with seizures or hypoglycemia or intoxication, and it reduces risk of aspiration if the patient vomits. Infections can cause upper airway swelling, and it can lead to inflammation of the larynx, trachea, and bronchi. Common cause of croup, the common cause is croup, and it's characterized by strider, and a barking cough. It commonly occurs in infants and small children. 
There are viral infections, and they're common, um, when, and they cause croup and bacterial infections. And then um, palatine tonsils can be inflamed in children as well. And this is rarely life-threatening, but avoid injury with the laryngoscope. So when we talk about the assessment, many deadly upper airway conditions are now rare thanks to widespread immunization. Croup and tonsillitis are common, but other conditions are rare. And these are critical emergencies when they are occurring, but you wanna avoid manipulating the airway unless absolutely necessary. Airway may be entirely obscured by swelling. So the laryngoscopy may worsen the swelling. Have your partner press on the chest while you check for bubble stream coming from the airway. Use of an ET tube at least two full sizes smaller than typically appropriate. And if your efforts fail, after a single attempt, a needle or surgical crike may be necessary. So aspiration, inhalation of anything other than breathable gases. Examples are water or blood, vomit, food, or foreign bodies. So there are some patients who are at a increased risk, and these are tube-fed patients when they're placed supine immediately after a large feeding, or geriatric patients with impaired swallowing, or unresponsive patients. Aspiration has a high mortality rate, common but profoundly dangerous complications in cardiac arrest in unresponsive patients. Determine scenario of sudden onset of dyspnea, so immediately after eating, or was there gastric feeding tube? Um, and if so, how long was the feeding and how large? So when it comes to management, you need to avoid gastric distension when ventilating and use a nasogastric tube to depress the stomach when necessary. Monitor the patient's ability to protect the airway and use an advanced airway when needed. Aggressively treat aspiration with suction and airway control, patients at risk for aspiration should not eat when they are having difficulty breathing. If basic maneuvers fail to clear the airway, use laryngoscopy and Miguel forceps and perform a needle or surgical crike if allowed by local protocol. Okay, so let's talk about obstructive lower airway diseases. And so the most common are emphysema and chronic bronchitis, also asthma. Emphysema and chronic bronchitis are classified as COPD because the pulmonary structure and function changes are chronic, progressive, and irreversible. Asthma is a condition with reversible narrowing of the airway. In obstructive disease, the positive exhalation pressure causes small airways to pinch shut, which traps gases in the alveoli. A number of physical findings can indicate obstructive airway disease pursed lips, increased IE ratio, abnormal muscle use, or jugular vein distension. So when it comes to asthma, let's talk about the pathophysiology first. Bronchial asthma is characterized by increased tracheal and bronchial reactivity to a variety of stimuli. In 2014, more than 24 million people in the United States had asthma. And, the, um, and it's increasing. The fastest growth of asthma rates are in children younger than five. Patients with potentially fatal asthma often have severely compromised ventilation all the time, at risk if acute bronchospasm is triggered or infection. So they may be at a high risk of respiratory arrest and can be fatal with severe psychiatric disorders or not following medication regimen. Asthma is sometimes referred to as a reactive airway disease. The patient experiences bronchospasms when exposed to certain triggers, and between attacks, the patient may be relatively asymptomatic. A severe prolonged asthma attack that does not stop with conventional treatment is status asthmaticus, and it's a dire medical emergency. So assume that any patient with asthma who feels sick enough to call the ambulance may be in status asthmaticus until proved otherwise. So 
return of the symptoms after inhaler use, this is sometimes caused by an underlying infection. Attacks will not um, subside until the trigger has been removed or mitigated. A patient in status asthmaticus will be struggling to move air, have um, predominant a use of accessory muscles, and have a maximally hyperinflated chest, possibly have the entirely inaudible breath sounds, or be exhausted and severely acidotic and dehydrated. Bronchospasm is caused by constriction of smooth muscle surrounding the larger bronchi. Bronchospasm may occur from stimulation by an allergen or irritant. And wheezing is caused by vibrations from the air being forced through constricted airways. Bronchial edema is the swelling of the bronchi and bronchioles also caused, causes termitant airflow, wheezing, and air trapping. Increased mucus production Distal airways may be plugged with thick secretions, which contribute to air trapping, and the patient may be significantly dehydrated because of the increased fluid loss from tachypnea and inadequate fluid intake. Antihistamine medications may thicken secretions even more. This image shows bronchial spasms compared to bronchial edema. So management, most patients have some combination of the three conditions, bronchospasm, bronchial edema, and excessive mucus secretion. Transport considerations include to determine the trigger of the attack. And if wheezing clears, but peak flow does not improve, the patient may need corticosteroids. If the patient is undernourished or dehydrated, he or she may meet, need IV fluids. Okay, so that was asthma. Now let's talk about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And remember, this includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis. COPD comprom um, comprises at least two distinct clinical etiologies, and that's emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Emphysema damages or destroys the terminal bronchial structures. Groups of alveoli merge into large blebs, basically which have less surface area for gas exchange. And trauma and diseases of the bones and muscles can significantly impair the ability to move air, causing a group of disorders known as restrictive lung disease, put patients at risk of infection, and may severely limit their ability to compensate for any respiratory insult. Do not generate many calls for EMS response though. And then chronic bronchitis is defined as sputum production most days of the month for three or more months out of the year for more than two years. Excessive mucus production in the bronchial tree accompanied by chronic or recurrent produ productive coughs, almost always a heavy cigarette smoker or usually overweight or congested and sometimes has a bluish complexion. So when it comes to assessment, two extremes of COPD, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis, most patients fall somewhere between the two extremes. Patients with emphysema often have a barrel chest, are tachypnic, and use their own muscle mass for energy in attempting to breathe. Causes of diffuse wheezing are left-sided heart failure, and that's cardiac asthma. Smoke inhalation or chronic bronchitis or acute pulmonary emboli. Localized wheezing from obstruction from a foreign body or a tumor as well. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients with pneumonia. So um, patients often have lung infections. You want to check for the presence of fever or the presence of other infection signs. Also auscultate breath sounds that are um, consistent with pneumonia. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients with right-sided heart failure. So it's difficult for right -sided, uh, the right side of the heart to push thick blood um, through the capillaries. COPD often causes right-sided heart failure from lung disease. The patient takes in too much salt or fluid or does not excrete significant fluid because of renal failure. It may cause a CHF episode. Look for peripheral edema, JVD, crackles, 
progressive increase in dyspnea or greater in usual fluid outtake and improper use of diuretics also. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients with left-sided heart failure, well, that's an abrupt left ventricular dysfunction, and it can cause a rapid onset of left-sided heart failure. Then you have exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So an exacerbation can cause a sudden decomp, decomposition with no co-pathologic conditions. Because of technical advances, patients with COPD are more mobile, but paramedics can be called because oxygen takes may be run out or medications may be left at home. End stage chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, so the lungs no longer support oxygen and ventilation. They may be in hospice care. It's difficult to determine whether an exacerbation can be resolved or not. AT innovation may make it impossible for the patient to make their own wishes and just uh, secure documentation of the patient's wishes and follow local protocol or contact medical control. When it comes to COPD patients and trauma, it lessens the person's ability to tolerate the trauma. So monitor closely because of decreased ability to compensate and normal oxygen saturations might be less than 90%. So achieving a saturation of 98 is unrealistic and possibly harmful. When it comes to management, associated bronchospasm, edema fluid, or hypoxia can often be relieved. Determine what caused the situation to worsen. And paramedics must understand that concepts of hypoxic drive and positive and expiratory pressure. So let's talk about that hypoxic drive. When a person's breathing stimulus comes from a decrease in the PaO2 rather than an increase in the PaO2. So it affects only a small percentage of uh, who have most relentless forms of pulmonary disease and discussion of whether to administer oxygen at this point, you must consider the following points. Even though only a small number of COD patient, COPD patients breathe because of a hypoxic drive, it's impossible to tell which ones. They do not suddenly become apneic after breathing oxygen. Use verbal and physical stimulation to encourage breathing and skin appearance may remain perfused if the patient becomes apneic because of increased oxygenation. Provide artificial ventilation and consider inhibition if the patient becomes apneic. No withholding oxygen for fear of decreasing the respiratory drive. Remember that 93% oxygen saturation levels are acceptable. Okay, so let's talk about auto PEEP. When ventilating patients with severe obstructive disease, they will have difficulty exhaling. Auto PEEP can eventually cause a pneumo in cardiac arrest. If there is possibly the possibility of auto PEEP, patients should be ventilated as slowly as four to six breaths a minute. Okay, so allow complete exhalation before the next breath is delivered or pressure in the thorax will continue to rise. And that's a phenomenon called auto peep. Okay, so next we just talked about COPD. So next we're gonna talk about pulmonary infections. And these infections are caused by bacteria or viruses or fungi or other organisms. The respiratory tract is vulnerable to airway agents that cause um, that in those that reside in the nose and throat. Infections, diseases, cause swelling of the respiratory tissues and an increase in mucus production and the production of pus. Resistance to airflow increases exponentially when the airway dynamiter is, diameter is narrowed. So alveoli may become non-functional if filled with fluid or pus. Pneumonia may be caused by a variety of bacterial, viral, or fungal agents. And bacterial pneumonia 
is usually caused by streptococcus. So a vaccine is available for this bacterium. Patients at a greater risk of pneumonia include older or chronic illness or people who smoke and those who are immunocompromised. All high-risk patients are strongly encouraged to get an annual vaccine. Antibiotic resistance organisms can colonize in the respiratory tract and that can be dangerous to paramedics. So always ask where the organism was found and where proper respiratory protection uh, if it's in the respiratory tract. Okay, so a patient with pneumonia usually reports several hours to days of weakness, a productive cough, fever, or chest pains that worsen by coughing. The illness may have started abruptly or gradually. Pneumonia is often a secondary infection following influenza. During physical exam, they may look ill or have a toxic appearance, or they may be coughing, present with crackles on auscultation. In advanced cases, they may have diminished or absent breath sounds or sputum. It could be thick. Or patients may experience pain from breathing. A pleural friction rub over the involved area may be heard. Pneumonia often occurs in lung bases, usually only one side. So patients are often dehydrated and supportive care includes oxygenation or secretion management, such as suctioning, transport to the closest appropriate facility. Bronchiodilators will not help pneumonia, but may slightly improve the patient's ability to ventilate. So management. When it comes to an upper airway infection, it may require aggressive airway management, and a lower airway infection may need supportive care and transport to the hospital. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is atelectasis, and that's when the alveoli are vulnerable to many disorders, so may collapse from obstruction in the uh, proximal airways or from external pressure, may be filled with pus blood or fluid, or damage from smoke or toxin exposure. About 79% of the airway that moves the lungs is gas nitrogen, it moves into the lungs, which uh, keeps the alveoli open. It is common for some alveoli in the human body to collapse from time to time. So sighing, coughing, and sneezing, and changing positions are believed to help open close alveoli. When these actions do not happen, increasing numbers of alveoli might collapse and not reopen. Eventually, entire lug segments may collapse. So the affected area can harbor pathogens that result in pneumonia. And check if the patient with fever has had a recent chest or abdominal surgery. Post-surgical patients are encouraged to get out of bed, cough, and breathe deeply. Use of that uh, of a spirometer helps to quantify breath depth. And this is often sent home with the patients after discharge. Next, we're going to talk about cancer. So lung cancer is one of the most common forms of cancer, especially among cigarette smokers and those exposed to occupational lung hazards or secondhand smoke. Lung cancer often presents with hematophysis, and that's coughing of blood and sputum. And uncontrolled coughing when tumor in the airway, uh, large airways bleed. So COPD in, and improper lung function frequently applying to lung cancer. And cancer from other body sites often metabolizes in the lung. Other cancers may involve lymph nodes in the neck. And cancer patients may get pulmonary complications from chemotherapy or radiation Tumors or cancer treatments may cause pleural effusions as well. So management, there's little pre-hospital treatment for pleural effusions. Paramedics are sometimes called to for end life measures. So depressed respiratory causes a large amount, uh, large amounts by narcotics. Um, so naloxone only to improve respiration. Do not reverse the patient's pain control. 
when it comes to toxic inhalations, the pathophysiology so many toxic substances can be inhaled. Damage depends on the water solubility of the toxic gases. Highly water soluble gases like ammonia react most mucous membranes. So this causes swelling and irritation in the upper airway. And less water soluble gases may get deep into the lower airways where they could damage over time. So uh, things like nitrogen dioxide. Moderately water soluble gases may have signs and symptoms somewhere between irritation and pulmonary edema. So a situation like mixing drain cleaner and chlorine bleach may produce an irritant chlorine gas that can sicken everyone in the home. Immediately remove the exposed patients from contact with the gas and provide 100% supplemental oxygen or assisted ventilations if the breathing is impaired. Patients exposed to slightly water-soluble gases may have an acute dyspnea hours after the incident. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is pulmonary edema. That's fluid buildup in the lungs, and it occurs when blood plasma fluid enters into the lungs. Pulmonary edema is classified as high pressure, and that's cardiogenic, or high permeability, and that's non-cardiogenic. And non-cardiogenic occurs after acute um, uh, hypoxia, and it's damage to the pulmonary capillaries by toxins or drugs in the bloodstream. Some present with significant pulmonary edema after a lengthy journey if they do not, uh, if they've not been taking their diuretics when traveling. And there are a few early signs. Um, by the time fine crackles in the lung bases become audible, fluid has leaked into the capillary or leaked out of the capillaries and increased diffusion space between the capillaries and alveoli and swollen the alveolar walls, and they've begun to seep into the alveoli. Listen to the lower lobes on the patient's back. Crackles may be heard higher in the patient's lung as pulmonary edema worsens, and as it worsens, patients will start to cough up watery sputum, and it's often um, pink-tinged with red blood cells. When uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, so it's seldom seen in the field, and it, the syndrome is caused by diffuse damage to the alveoli from shock or uh, aspiration of gastric contents, pulmonary edema, barotrauma, or a hypoxic event. So the syndrome is worsen, is worse when there is direct damage to the lungs. And during a near-death crisis, alveoli begin sti become stiff and difficult to ventilate. So it's similar to that for any patient with respiratory problems, the assessment, just document oxygen saturation, breath sounds, and any sudden changes, and then carefully monitor and ventilate. When we talk about uh, pneumothorax, that's when air collects between the visceral and parental pleura and blebs, weak spots that can rupture under stress, and it may predispose patient with a pneumo. It causes of stress may be simple as coughing or as severe as aggressive bag valve mass ventilation. Patients may have had multiple different pneumothoraces and patients may have sharp pain after coughing or increasing dyspnea in subsequent minutes or hours. Okay, when it comes to management of a pneumo, most patients will not require acute interventions and they should receive oxygen and close monitoring of their respiratory status. With a pleural effusion, and it's when a sac of fluid similar to a blister that has formed when fluid collects between the visceral and parental, parental pleura. So uh, it can be caused by infections or tumors or trauma and the lung tissues rub against each other, causing inflammation and fluid accumulation. So pleural effusions can contain several liters of fluid, and a large effusion decreases the lung's capacity and causes dyspnea. It may be hard to hear breath sounds, and the patient's position will affect the ability to breathe. 
a shift in position may cause more dyspnea, and the Fowler's position will likely be the most comfortable. Supportive care should be used until the patient is transporter, transported, and large effusions may be drained at a medical facility in a procedure called orthorocentesis. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is a pulmonary embolism, and its pulmonary circulation may be compromised by a blood clot, and that's an embolism, or fat embolism, or amniotic fluid embolism, or an air embolism from a neck laceration or IV that was improperly or not flushed. A large embolism usually lodges in a major branch of the pulmonary artery, and this prevents blood flow. Normal alveoli will not work if the venous blood cannot reach them. When it comes to pulmonary embolism assessments, um, it has a confusing presentation. So early presentation may have normal breath sounds with good peripheral um, assertion. And the classic presentation is sudden dyspnea and cyanosis with a possible sharp chest pain. Um, cyanosis does not end with oxygen therapy. Pulmonary emboli often begin in a large vein of the neck where clots can form and migrate into the pulmonary circulation. Clots may form when patients are uh, immobile for prolonged periods. When it comes to management, bedridden patients are often prescribed anticoagulants or special stockings or other devices to reduce blood clot formation in the legs. A green filled filter may be inserted into patients with a history of deep venous thrombosis or DVTs, and this filter opens like a mesh umbrella to collect clots traveling from the legs in a main vein returning blood to the heart. A saddle umbilicus or emboli is an especially large pulmonary emboli that lodges at a bifurcation of the right and left pulmonary arteries and may be immediately fatal. Few patients survive cardiac arrest caused by these large pulmonary emboli. Okay, so this concludes Chapter 16, Respiratory Emergencies. We hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and join us here again for more chapters from the 8th edition, Emergency Care in the Streets. Thank you.